So I'm going to be presenting on making great calls, and as uh, Michael alluded to, there were a little bit of last minute changes, so we're going to make this a little bit more leadership y. So making great and, there we go, making great and appealing calls. Get it? You will. And for those, of you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manny. Just to give you a brief introduction for those of you who I didn't get to work with this weekend, I like combo decks, long walks on the beach, bad jokes, unnecessary slides, overthinking things, and telling you. stories. And so I wanted to start off this presentation with a story that is one of the reasons why I started putting together some version of the Great Calls, a seminar that I've been giving for about three years now. Is it about 30? Um, I want to preface this with the fact that each of the stories that I'm going to tell over the course of this presentation is from a real grudge call that I witnessed firsthand. And with only one exception, all of these stories, regardless of how the call themselves ended up, involved a judge that I look up to very highly. So bear that in mind. I want to take that moment to emphasize that this presentation is going to cover things that I think we can all improve on. So. This happened a couple of years back. For those of you that might recognize the cards, it's going to be a little difficult to read. But this happened in an event where a player controlled a Whisperwood Elemental, which has a trigger at the beginning of its controller's end step. It's going to take the top card of their library and make it a face down creature. They also controlled the Corsair of Crucifix, so both players knew what the top card of the library was. And in this case, it's a Hornet Queen, which is a creature with a very good enters the battlefield creature that would be a very bad face down creature. So this player finishes their turn, and they pass the turn, forgetting this is a triggered ability. They pass it to their opponent's turn, who then takes a couple of actions, takes their full turn, and then passes the turn back, also having forgotten one. As the player is drawing that card for their turn, putting it in their hand, the opponent finally remembers, wait a minute, I don't want you to draw that. You should have manifested that. And they call for a judge. The players explain that there's a mistriggered ability here, and the judge is explaining why a, we're past the window when this triggered ability can be put back on the stack. And also, there's the additional wrinkle here that we're in the draw step and that card is drawn. Even if we put this triggered ability on the stack now, they're not getting that Hornet Queen onto the battlefield. And the judge is explaining this, and the players keep saying, but it's not a May. The players keep saying, but I, I caught it and I know that I can put it on the stack. And that's really where they get hung up on. I'm going to do this a couple of times. Apologies. There we go. Can't I put it onto the stack? And the judge tries to explain this, and eventually the judge offers an appeal. The player says, you know what, nope, it's fine. And just scoops the match and ends right there. And this judge, who again I looked up to very highly, turns to me right after they finish filling out that penalty on the slip, and says, I just could not sell that for the life of you. And they weren't sure why. And that was very much the genesis of this presentation. I think the judge program, especially when it comes to common things like taking judge calls, one of the most common skills that judges practice in this program, we're very good at sharing tips. And everybody has their own style and their own techniques and their own things they've picked up. But we don't really have a good foundation or a good architecture to put those tips onto. So it just becomes a collection of things that we remember, but that doesn't really help us digest why a call went well or went wrong. So that's what I want to provide in this conference here. I want to provide structure, and ultimately that structure is going to give us three payoffs. It's going to be structure for us handling calls ourselves. It's going to be structure that's going to enable us to think about calls, so that we can think about why a call went well, didn't go well, how it could have gone better. And since this conference is a leadership focus, it's going to be structure for how we can discuss calls and help mentor each other and help teach others about how their calls could have gone better, could have gone differently, what makes a call good. So, the way I want to approach this seminar, we're going to start with the foundation of just what the basics are for what I think will help make a call great. We're going to add on to that the layer, which is going to be how that applies to appeals in particular. And then for tips, we're not going to focus that much in this presentation on tips. Tips are going to be kind of the icing on the cake, and we're going to want to make sure that in this presentation we get a very solid foundation. So this will be the focus of our presentation. I want to give you a heads up before we get too much into it. This presentation is going to be super dense. I talk a lot, and it's going to be hard to keep up, and it's going to be a little hard to write notes in here. So I'm going to try as much as I can to pause where there's, I think, an important note that if you had to write down the five or so takeaways from this presentation, I'll try to call those out. Well, thank you. What can you do? All right. So with that said, let's get into it. 
And let's begin just by saying, what are some basic types of judge calls? Just to get on the same page here. So let's get about three or four hands in the air and say, what are some types of judge calls? Right here in the front. What does this Japanese card say? What does this Japanese card say? So a player needing oracle text because they can't read it or don't know what the current oracle text is. I saw another hand against the wall there. Can I get oracle text? Yes. Uh, in the back. The second you post something online, what do my cards do? Absolutely. So we need to understand an interaction. Uh, in the back and then the last one will be in the front. Yes. Failure to agree on reality. Failure to agree on reality. So the players have some uh, discrepancy between their perceptions of what's going on and they need you to help adjudicate. And as I said, last one here in the front. Customer service things like can I go to the bathroom or I lost something. Yep. Other things that we can assist players with. So I haven't figured out how to rig it so that I can make them appear in the order that you all set them, but we pretty much touched on all of them. So just to go through them. We've got whether or not I have any social beliefs. Clicking to do. Here we go. We've got rules clarifications, oracle text. Some infraction occurred or might have occurred, and the players want help restoring the game state, but also recording the necessary penalties. Uh, they might want us to watch for slow play or other types of inappropriate behavior in their match. And of course, there might be some of the customer service elements that are not always every judge's favorite questions to answer, like where's the blue gathering points. And that might not be always our favorite, but these are kind of the arena of what we're talking about when we talk about judge calls. This spans a lot of different things. So for this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the situations where an infraction occurs. Not because they're the most important, but because I think there's the most depth to them, and therefore we'll be able to build out the most detailed structure. And then for simpler situations, we're going to have pieces that don't apply as much, but I think this is where we're going to be able to build the most thorough foundation. So let's dig into it. What makes a judge call great? Let's get three adjectives for what makes a judge call great for people I haven't heard from yet. Yes. Clarity. Clarity. Let's, let's get two more. Yeah, here's the one. Brevity. Brevity is important. Absolutely. And let's get one more. Uh, right here. Efficiency. Absolutely. Clarity, brevity, and efficiency kind of go together. Um, sure. One more. Attitude. Attitude. Can you can you elaborate on that just a moment? I feel like okay, hey, please. I choose to take a lot of self. Hey, How can I help you? Absolutely. So attitude, and we got a demonstration of the difference between an upbeat attitude in responding to the calls versus just kind of a, a drained or slower attitude. Absolutely. Uh, if I had to kind of pull all those together along with the additional metrics and kind of just put it into a very, very high level summary, the way I would phrase all that is the two things that we need to make sure our judge calls are great is they need to be correct obviously as a baseline requisite and they need to be satisfied that's the word i would use to kind of encapsulate everything that we just described um, and in order to make sure our calls are correct we're going to want to go in this presentation and talk about figuring out what to say so that we figure out how the correct what the correct answer is and how to best deliver it and then we're going to tailor that answer to the players and to the specific situation that we're in with me so far? Seeing some nods, good. So let's dig into figuring out what to say. Um, you're going to need to figure out the info that matters to you in this call. When you arrive at a call, the two players who are already there, or more players, are the experts of that situation, and you, uh, important judge that you are, are clueless. So the first thing you need to do is get the info you need. So, I've got two easy ways for you to get that information. You're going to ask questions, and you're going to ask questions. <laughs> but let's go into a little bit more detail, judging from that reaction. So I want to talk about open versus closed questions. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard these terms before? Okay, a little more than half of you. Cool. So we'll go through this pretty quickly then, but just to make sure we're on the same page. Starting with talking about open questions. Open questions are, as the name suggests, open-ended. They're not specific, and they invite the answerer to say kind of whatever they want. In an interview, this is kind of like giving the microphone to that person, and now they have the speaking step. They are, at the end of the day, an inquiry. So can we get some examples of open-ended questions here? Let's get to it. Uh, here in the middle. 
What happened here? Absolutely. The answer can respond whatever they want. Another one over here. What is your plan? What is your plan for this turn? Again, the answer is, has kind of free range to answer that question. And these are both examples that kind of fit for a magic context. So you see an open-ended question there is giving the answer a lot of latitude. By contrast, a closed question, the question itself suggests what its own possible answers could be. It's specific. And it prompts the answer to confirm or deny something. That could be and maybe is a yes or no question, but it might be a specific question that isn't yes or no, but has a set of answers that are in the question itself. Like, whose turn is it? When did you pass that? Can we get, let's get another two examples here of closed questions that you might ask in a magic setting. Uh, all the way in the back. Where are we in the turn? Yep, there's a finite list of phases that we're looking for an answer. Yeah, back, other side. When did you notice that something happened or that something went awry? Yep. Absolutely. They are, at the end of the day, unlike an inquiry, they are a request. Going back to the interview metaphor, you are still holding the microphone, and when they finish answering, you're taking it right back. So, these are the two types of questions, and while we're all familiar with the concepts, I want to apply them here to the context of getting info you need in a judge call. You want to ask open questions to gather information and orient yourself. I'm a big fan of doing that, of having the first questions you ask when you arrive to take it the open-ended. Not just the generic phrasing of uh, how can I help you or whatever you prefer to use to arrive at a call, but also if a player even just asks, hey, what happens here? I like to immediately respond with, walk me through what's happening here. You want to make sure you understand the situation because, again, you're arriving, you're clueless to the situation. The players know everything. They are the experts. After you get some of that information and orient yourself, that's where you can bring in those close questions to pin down details and make sure that you and the players are on the same page. So that's where you can ask, okay, so it sounds like you're casting that spell in response to their creature. And that's where you bring in those open, uh, those closed questions to make sure, okay, yes, we agree on what we've just discussed. Does that make sense here so far? Cool. So, once we've got the info we need, what's a process for finding the right answer? I'm going to go through this a little quickly, but it's a simple three-step process. I want you to think about the right answer as having these three components that happen in this order. Fraction, penalty, fix. And I want to emphasize again, in this order. How many of you have had a call where you thought to yourself, oh, this is some kind of war? Show of hands. Okay. Yep, definitely me. Or can't we just correct their life totals for something that seems obvious but happened several turns ago? And part of the reason why these moments are very difficult for us to wrestle with is because we're starting at the wrong point in this process. The way the policy documents are set up, what infraction it is, is what informs what penalty it is, is what prescribes what fix we can use. So if we start from the wrong place in that sequence, then we get ourselves all messed up. And that's how we find ourselves saying, okay, well, I want to just change life titles. Oh, wait, but they also did that. And then we have to reevaluate the call. And we find ourselves struggling to deliver a satisfying experience, as well as starting to get a little bit of panic and tension as the call goes on for ourselves. So. For those of you who are waiting to jump on me, because I said this was all judge calls, yes, this is IMG specific language, so let's generalize it to the other document that we work with, the JAR. So for the JAR, we still have a three-step process here. We've got what type of issue is it in the document. We don't have penalties frequently, though we technically do, but in this phase, that penalty is about educating the players. And of course, we're still going to have some fix that's prescribed in the jar by, again, what type of issue it is. And once again, even at regular relevance, there are going to be these steps in this order. And really, if you want to think about it without thinking about it tied to any particular document, the three steps here are just what went wrong, what happens to the players? What do they need to know about what's going to happen to them right now? And then how do we fix it? Frequently, we start here because it's the first thing we want to do. We want to get them back to playing magic. But depending on the situation, we still need to answer these. And if we start getting to them out of order, we can make it a lot trickier for us. I think this is one of the things I want to emphasize if you're taking notes about the general how you approach what you should be saying. I would say, well, keep this in mind. You want your infraction penalty fixed. What went wrong? What happens to the players? How do we fix it? 
So now we've gathered the info that we needed, and we put that info into this structure. We're ready to deliver the ruling. There we go. So that's how we avoid answering questions like, do they still get the trigger without figuring out where we are? Do I issue a game loss? Is this HD or GRB? Those bubbles appeared in the backwards order of how you want to be approaching this, just to continue illustrating more. So figuring out what to say. You're going to gather info. As I mentioned, that's where you're going to bring in those open questions to orient yourself, those closed questions to pin down the details, confirming your understanding with the players. Uh, depending on your style, I sometimes like to repeat the whole situation back to them, even for a very simple one, to make sure, sure that we're all on the same page and get buy-in from the players. And you're going to deliver your ruling. And when you deliver that ruling, I encourage you not just to think of it in that order, but to deliver it in this order. Deliver it such as, uh, so what happened here, this is called a game law violation that will come with a warning, and what we're going to do is X, Y, or C. Being able to deliver it in that order and figure it out in that order makes sure that you cover your bases so that you don't forget to mention that this is a warning. And it also makes sure that you're clear in explaining why things are happening the way they are. So, now going back towards the structure that we wanted to set up, let's see how much of it we've just covered so far. Yeah, about half of the call basics. All right. So, uh, let's move on. So we talked about figuring out what to say. Now let's talk about tailoring it to the players. So I said satisfying earlier. Satisfying can mean a lot of things. And obviously, one of the biggest elements of whether or not a player is happy with the outcome of a call is whether or not it resolved the game state in a matter that benefits them. And we don't have any control over that, despite what many players may believe. Um, but we do have control over our ability to make the call satisfying. And to use another term here to kind of further narrow down what I mean by satisfying here, a call is satisfying or a player will feel satisfied when they feel addressed. Even, and going back to the call that I mentioned earlier with the Whisperwood Elemental, I noted that the player was given the option to appeal even though they were getting what they, they weren't getting the answer they wanted, and they didn't take that option up and instead bailed out of the game. So even though they didn't appeal, and normally you think of appeals as these scary things or an indicator of something having gone wrong in our player interaction, here they didn't appeal because they were so unsatisfied that they didn't want to pursue the judge interaction further at all. So, when I say address the player, I'm going to break this down even further. I want, to, I want us to think about addressing their familiarity, addressing their expectations, and addressing their question itself. We're going to dig into each of these a little bit deeper, but I just want to see, how are we doing? Am I going too fast for everyone? Seeing some shaking heads? All right, those few people are speaking for all of you. Let's keep going. <laughs> Let's talk about familiarity. When we say familiarity, I'm talking about what is the player's knowledge base? What do they know? The punchline here is make sure they can understand your ruling and your explanation. If you give them an explanation that they can't understand, even if yours is correct, it doesn't matter. You're not there to prove to the player that you know the rules and policy. That's useless. You're there to give the player the answer that they need. So, how do we address their familiarity? There's a couple things I want you to look out for to get a sense for what their level of familiarity is. What about are they? This could be informative for how familiar they are and how new they are to the game. What terminology does the player use? Does the player say things like fizzle? Do they refer to things that aren't triggered abilities as triggered abilities? That's a common joke that we like to make as a sign of places where players don't get kind of how the game is constructed. But it's also very informative because it shows to them that they understand that there's a subset of actions within the game that function a certain way. Uh, when giving your ruling or discussing with them, don't introduce shorthand or jargon. Going back to what terminology are they using, try to match it. So if the player is saying fizzle, Try to avoid terms like counted upon resolution in your answer unless it clarifies some, some point that they're having trouble understanding. And focus on what's relevant to their question. So this is my one example of a ruling that helped inspire this that is not necessarily a judge that I looked up to. But I remember at my first Magic in <coughs> Vegas, as fate yeah. would have it, walking past uh, a judge call that was happening in a foiled again event which is a regular rules enforcement level three round draft event. And I overheard a judge say, first off, damage doesn't kill creatures, state-based actions do. 
So I, I What's wrong with this? Version. Without having heard anything else in the ruling, and I didn't because I was walking from one stage to another when I overheard this, how do you know there's something wrong with this ruling? When I started doing it's not answering the question the player asked. Are there any players, or is, is there any question you can think of in a limited event that actually needs to distinguish between a lightning bolt killing a creature and an SBA killing a creature outside of unstable, thank you, rules lawyer? Uh, one hand up in the back, yeah? This was Modern Masters, it was not Tarnaboy. Uh, yeah, could have been. So, um, I mentioned earlier that you want to make sure you stick to what's relevant to them. I did catch up with this judge later and try to ask, hey, so why did the explanation go to this place? And the judge started explaining that they wanted to help build up the player's base and they thought it was important that they understand how it works. Maybe in abstract, but this, I guarantee you, did not help them in their call and didn't help them feel like they understood what the judge was saying. All right. Let's move on. We talked about familiarity. Let's talk about what it means to address their expectations, which is, of course, what do they expect to happen? The punchline here is that you should address their assumptions about what will or won't happen. How many of you have had an interaction where, after explaining a ruling, a player repeats their initial question to you, such as, yeah, but it's not a May ability? But to kind of avoid these situations, we want to make sure that we're proactively addressing what they expect to happen. And frequently, there's a lot of tells that we can find out that'll give us a hint about that. For example, do they think they know the answer is the most obvious one. And you can kind of see that frequently. They'll ask you a closed question, which is going to suggest that they know some of the possible answers. You could also check, I, as I just mentioned, are they asking open or closed questions? So they're asking you something like, how do my cards work? A very open-ended question that shows that they're not really certain what's going on, or they can't miss that, right? Which shows that they have a clear expectation for what's coming next. And uh, make sure you include their expectation in your answer. This can be as simple as, well, whether or not it's a May ability doesn't affect what's happening here. And that can help preempt the player reasserting their understanding and make it clear that you heard them and are addressing what they believe the answer will be. So let's talk about a ruling from another Magic Fest Vegas, not the first one. But this wasn't intentional. Um, so we have a player with some giant monster, let's say Greater Sandworm, just a creature with big power and toughness. This is a smaller one off screen on the board. And the player plays a Cartouche of Strength, which is an aura with an Enter the Battlefield ability that's going to have this creature fight and beat up that other smaller creature. And this same player also controls a Trial, which has an ability that's going to trigger when that Cartouche enters the battlefield. So the player plays it, says, I have my worm fight your zombie points to it, the opponent says sure, starts moving their zombie off the battlefield, and then the player says, oh, and I return my trial of ambition to my hand. And the judge is called over, and the player tries to point out that this trigger was missed, and the judge rules, we actually have it moved past the state where this trigger ability can't resolve. And the player wants to appeal here. Can anybody guess why the player believes this trigger was missed? Here in the middle. Yep. It wasn't specifically mentioned until the O and this. It wasn't specifically mentioned until the O, so it came up later. The player, when they kept explaining why they thought this ability was missed, kept emphasizing <coughs> the O here. Yes, right here in the middle. Yeah, saying O kind of indicates that O I forgot this. Like I'm I'm surprised at myself catching that this should have happened. Absolutely. The player here who was appealing believed, correctly in this case, that the opponent did forget about that triggered ability until a certain point. So they were very upset and confused when the other player actually got that triggered ability. So one suggestion I would make here for including their, uh, including their expectations is noting the fact that, um, as some people like the phrase, it's not called forgotten trigger, it's called missed trigger. Make sure to indicate, yes, your opponent might have forgotten until this point, but the game state hasn't advanced past where this triggered ability can still resolve. So that's an example here of addressing something that very clearly indicates why the player believes it will happen that way, and make sure we explain why it doesn't work that way. And lastly, addressing their question. This sounds a little tautological, so I want to explain what they mean. The player is trying to find out or do something. 
and we want to make sure that your answer matches their question. If it's not clear to them that you're answering their question, they won't parse what you are saying as the answer to their question. That's the equivalent of kind of saying, hey, what time is the next event? Well, we haven't put up the pairings for other events. We know that that's the answer to their question, but if we've given them that answer in that form without matching it to what they've asked, they won't know that we're actually answering their question. So, how do we make sure to do that? The simplest one is just include their question in their answer, such as, no, uh, we can't put that trigger on the stack now, just repeating their question in your answer. Use the same or similar phrasing in terms, going back to familiarity. If they say fizzle, say fizzle. Respond directly to the question that they asked. So in the example I just gave, no, we can't resolve that triggered ability now. You're following their question directly with an immediate answer that connects directly to what they just said, and then rephrasing what they just said to make it clear that you're answering what they are asking. And of course, stick to your script. So when players start kind of answering back, sticking to infraction, penalty, fix, and making sure you're delivering this information in that order helps keep you grounded, helps make sure you cover most of what they're going to be asking about and helps make sure you are clear and consistent when addressing the players. So, let's go back to this ability here. Can I put it onto the step? What does the player want to happen? What is the player trying to do, achieve, or find out? Uh, third row in the middle. Yep, that's you. Cool. They're trying to get the Hornet Queen manifested. They're trying to get Hornet Queen out of the player's hand and onto the battlefield. Exactly. So when the judge was explaining the timing rules about when it's triggers, that ends up at the point, uh, ends up at the fact that they can't manifest the Hornet Queen, but it's not explicitly addressing that. And so the player was kept referring to things that they know to be true. I know that I can put some mistriggers on the stack. I know that there's some window for catching them that I can do it. But because that judge was not actually answering the question directly, the player wasn't understanding why they couldn't get what they wanted. They felt like they were just encountering a brick wall here. So, let's just quickly recap here. We talked about tailoring to the players. That's going to be addressing their familiarity by answering in terms that they understand, and if we need to use them, explaining once they don't. Addressing their expectations by confirming or correcting those assumptions. Addressing their question by responding directly to what they're trying to accomplish. So, now let's build up our pyramid. We've now covered the second half of call basics and appeals, so that's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I didn't think that was that funny, but I gave it a shot anyway. So obviously, we're not done here. So we want to cover appeals. Let's go back to what we want appeals to be. I think at the end of the day, fundamentally, appeals also, just like floor judge calls, need to be correct and satisfied. So let's start by talking about what makes an appeal different? What makes appeals scarier or feel different from regular judge calls? Let's get two or three just quick answers here. Yeah, here in the front. You're being challenged. You feel like you're being challenged, absolutely. In the middle, I might be wrong. You might be wrong, and that kind of is, is a little scary sometimes. Uh, last one all the way in the back. Usually the appealing judge is probably a more senior or more experienced than you. The appealing judge, the one answering the appeal, can be more senior or experienced than the floor judge, and that can create an uncomfortable dynamic, absolutely. <coughs> um, at the end of the day, if I had to summarize it here, I would say, I would wonder where my screen went. There we go. I would say that an appeal, <clears throat> uh, an appeal means, <laughs> man, this mouse. Here we go. I'm sorry. You're fine. An oh appeal means a player wanted something more from the call that they just had. So your first order of business in answering it is not in responding to the challenge, is not in asserting authority. Your first answer here in an appeal, the first thing you need to address is, why did the player appeal? And it's not always for the same reason. It can be they agree with the ruling, but just wanted another shot at getting a different one. It can be they agree with the game, with the fix, but not the penalty. They just don't want to get a warning for it. It could be that they didn't understand it, or they were frustrated and thought that the judge didn't connect to something they were trying to say. There's a lot of different reasons, and it's your job to figure out what it is in order to successfully address the player. So how are we going to go about doing this? 
it's going to be pretty similar to the process I went through for how to answer a call, which is why I started with the basics, spend a lot of time in them, and I made that pretty bad joke about the, the presentation being over already. We're going to start with getting the info you need. And we're going to do this, first and foremost, by asking our floor judge. So this is the first thing that's different from how an appeal is going to flow, is that if you are the head judge, your first point of information is not the players, but it's the floor judge that's bringing the appeal to you. And there can be a lot of panic and a lot of effort to be very expedient, as was mentioned earlier, and to provide a call with a lot of brevity. And of course, we're very worried about extensions. But I encourage you all to take some time at this step. One of the things that I've noticed with appeals is that seconds will save you minutes. Taking a little bit extra time to get the information you need and handle things smoothly will save several minutes of repetition and struggle. So ask your floor judge, what happened? Just get that starting point, walk them, uh, have them walk you through what happened when they arrived, what ruling was delivered, and of course make sure you ask them for what was the infraction, what was the penalty, what was the fix, and if the floor judge already knows, if the players mentioned it, ask the floor judge, why did the players appeal? Maybe the players told them, or maybe the floor judge has an idea. And that is going to inform you on how you want to approach it. You're going to get to the table, and we're going to do open and close questions again, but this time it's going to be a little bit backwards, because you already have some information. So instead, you're going to repeat the situation and ruling to the players to get a clear starting point. You're going to confirm what you got from your floor judge with some closed questions, just to say, OK, I just got here. Are we starting on the same page? Cool. I'm going to give you a moment to write that down. And if you didn't guess already by the fact that I said we're going to do things a little bit backward, um, then we're going to move on to giving the players a turn. So when we show up, sometimes I've seen some judges handle an appeal by starting by just restating it. Is this the case? Is this the case? Yes? OK, it's upheld. And I frequently see that situation being very unsatisfying to players. I mentioned that the big core of being satisfied is feeling addressed. And even if the ruling is correct and delivered expediently and efficiently, if the player feels like they were just brushed off and didn't get any input, they are unhappy with that ruling. So give the players a turn. Use open questions so that they can lead you. And they will show you, if you let them talk, what they wanted more from the call. You'll find out what they need. And importantly, especially because, as we mentioned, we're worried about getting it wrong, you'll see if you missed anything. If you skip this step about asking open questions here, if there was something that was overlooked in the floor judge's ruling or an assumption you didn't realize you make, you don't have any way to avoid it. But if you make sure to stop here and ask for some open questions, they might show you something that you had forgotten to consider. Tailoring it to the players. And again, I'm going to be going back over the three basic components here, addressing their familiarity, their expectations, and their questions. But I want to mention the specific forms it can take in an appeal. So as I mentioned, you really want to focus in on why did they appeal. And when you have this structure to think back on, you can think about which of these areas that I described was lacking in the initial ruling, or did the players feel was lacking. So for instance, you're going to want to address their familiarity by explaining the ruling in a different way and using terms that they repeat often. As I mentioned, if you let the players talk enough, they will lead you to what they need to know or what they're fixating on. So if you find them repeating a term often, that's something that you will cue you into how much they know and what you should include. You want to address their expectations by including the outcome that they want or expect when explaining your ruling. So make sure to explicitly call that out. And you want to address their question by leading them from the question to the final result of their appeal. This is just rephrasing what I said earlier in a different way. You really want to make sure you're connecting directly from what they've posed to you to where we're ending up and why the final result is an uphold or an overturn and what the final fix is. You might notice the final key here, which is phrases like they repeat, they want or expect, their question. If I had to punchline appeals, the key that you want to keep in mind is you need to meet the player where they are at. I want to emphasize what I said earlier. It is not about proving that you have the authority as the head judge. It is not about demonstrating your rules knowledge or your policy knowledge. If that doesn't connect to where the players are at, it won't help them and you won't make their call satisfying. All right, let's go quickly through just one example. And I had the benefit of working with an awesome judge this weekend, and we encountered a strange situation that I think serves as a great kind of little clinic 
for how we might want to think about a situation like this. Uh, we had a player with a river boa. They cast Savage Swipe, which is going to pump their river boa and have it fight something. The opponent responds by trying to kill river boa. And the controller responds by regenerating river boa. At this point, the judge is called. And the player who's trying to destroy river boa is asking, does regeneration stop this spell from resolving? Stop river boa from getting a bonus and then fighting another creature. And the judge ruled, no, it does not. And the player said, OK, I'd like to appeal that. And the judge asked, why would you like to appeal that? And the player very tersely simply responded with, I just want to appeal. So here we have a player that's non-cooperative and unsatisfied and not a lot of information to go by, at least on the surface level. But I think that we do have some information here. So let's see if we can break this down. I just want to appeal. So they're kind of refusing to cooperate and tell us a little bit more. But does anybody here have any idea of why they want to appeal here? Change the outcome. We've got one answer here. They want to change the outcome. That's a possibility, certainly. Here in the middle. Uh, they didn't get like a customer service response. It wasn't a satisfying result for them, okay. uh, even if it was not my favorite. It's possible that they did get a satisfying result. Uh, one more here in the front. Uh, they realize they made, they made a mistake, and they don't want it. <coughs> They realize they may have made a mistake, and they don't want it. Yep, I think that's kind of similar to wanting a different outcome here. Uh, so let's get one third option uh, in the middle middle. Um, they think uh, that it works the way like it does in a different situation in combat. And they okay. think there's a, a, a analysis that they're not actually going to get. So to repeat that, they think that it works a different way based on how it works in a different situation, such as combat. Okay, and I might want to, let's, let's expand on that a little bit. Um, what does the player know about regeneration? Do we know anything based on this question? It seems like they think it removes it from combat. We have someone suggesting it seems like they think it removes it from combat. That would be a good point. And let's see if we can expand on that a little bit here. I saw a hand go up right here. Uh, a lot of players think regenerate works like undying or persist, and that it dies and comes back. So we also have another point here. So in combat, the creature is removed. Uh, some players believe that regeneration might work like undying or persist, in which it changes zones and returns to the battlefield. Clearly, they understand that regeneration affects the state of the creature in some way. And perhaps from other common contexts, they might think that that's going to change its zone or change its state in a way that, they, that makes this spell invalid. If I had to guess, we talked about wanting a different outcome. We talked about feeling like they didn't get good customer service. If I had to guess in this particular case, based on just this very brief interaction, the player doesn't believe the judge or doesn't understand why the answer is what it is here. <coughs> so one way that we might want to help provide uh, a little bit more of a comprehensive response in a situation like this is by maybe seeing if, depending on how confident we feel in why the player is appealing, starting by perhaps explaining, OK, well, Regeneration might remove a creature from combat, but it's still on the battlefield, so it's still a legal target for this spell. It hasn't been removed by that. Or if we're worried about that being a little too explainy, we can just say, well, regeneration doesn't move the creature away. It's still a legal target. Either way, a phrase like, it's still a legal target for this spell is going to get us a little bit closer to making sure that the player understands why the answer is what it is. And that might help them get a more satisfying conclusion to a ruling like this. And I want to repeat, as I mentioned above, the examples I'm using here are from very experienced judges. And the rulings are not incorrect. And the rulings are not, I think, poorly done. I'm using this as an example of places where rulings can be delivered in a more satisfying way. And there's many examples, just from my own history as a judge, where I felt like, man, you walk away and you go like, I could have done that better. Or I don't know why that didn't go well. I don't know why they were that unhappy. And hopefully here, the structure that we've gone over will help answer that question. So we are just about done. So let's just wrap up real quickly here. Um, these are the points that I want to make sure you've written down. So I'm just going to go through them real fast to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to let you get some food. So I want you to consider the basics of a great call being that the call is correct and satisfying that the way you get a call to be correct is by figuring out what to say ahead of time, and that you figure you make it satisfying by making sure you're tailoring your answer to the players. The same situation can be answered or delivered in different ways to different situations to make sure that the player is satisfied. You're going to want to 
really pay attention to what's going on. And let's kind of wrap this up in this way. I talked about putting together call basics, putting together appeals, and then I said we weren't really going to touch too much on tips. This is where I want to plug back into that thing that the program does really well, which is sharing tips. It's not that there's a set of right tips or a consistent structure the way I tried to articulate one here. It's that tips are where you shine. So what I hope you're able to do at the end of this is that once you have this foundational sense of what makes a good call great in general and what additional elements you want to focus on when handling an appeal from either side, now you can start thinking about what you do well, what you like to do, or what can improve various parts that you want to shore up. So really, it's not so much that the tips go all the way on the top, so much as they fill in all the cracks all throughout, and that's how you make calls your own. So, closing thoughts. I know that this has been a lot. I know that you might want to talk more about when a judge call goes wrong or have had some more complex examples. You could have really any number of thoughts going on here. But hopefully this gives you a baseline that you can work through. And um, at the end of the day, I know judge calls are something super common. And especially for experienced judges, we might think about them less and treat them something as we're passively fluent in. But I hope that this has given you something that you can think about and a way that you can digest calls that you've seen, taken, or trying to mentor judges on. So uh, yeah, for real this time. <laughs>